Jesus, we thank you that you have rescued us, given us, given us hearts and voices to sing your praises. We'll do this for all of eternity. We long for the day that you will bring us home. We long for the day when you will set everything right and subject all things to your good and glorious rule. And we have so much to look forward to. And God, in these next few moments, as we look at your word again about what it means to dwell in your presence, uh, we pray that our hearts would be drawn to you, the giver of all good things. And we ask it in Jesus' name. I think the last time I was standing here, uh, we were diagramming sentences together. <laughs> Wasn't that much better? <laughs> Could get through that one. You were crying then too. Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's almost like we rehearsed that. That was well done, Jamie. That was good. <laughs> we should have thought about that. All right. Uh, turn to the page in your notebooks called The Architecture of Heaven. The architecture of heaven. What is that eternal state going to be like? Turn in your Bibles to Revelation 21. And if you didn't get that cup of coffee, you should have. <laughs> We're going to read Revelation 21 and 22 in their entirety. This is the section of your Bible which gives the most detail about the new heavens and new earth. John reports, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. For the first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper, it had a great and high wall with twelve gates, and the gates were twelve angels, and the names were written on them, at the gates were twelve angels, excuse me, and the names were written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel. There were three gates on the east, and three gates on the north, and three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had twelve foundation stones, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its wall. The city is laid out as a square, and its length is as great as its width. And he measured the city with a rod 1,500 miles. Its length and width and height are equal. And he measured its wall 72 yards according to human measurements, which are also angelic measurements. 
The material of the wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundation stones of the city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation stone was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh uh, something, (laughs) the twelfth amethyst, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass, and I saw no temple in it. For the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. In the daytime, for there will be no night there, its gates will never be closed. And they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. And nothing unclean and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it. But only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb in the middle of its street. On either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his slaves will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and there will no longer be any night, and they will not have need of the light of a lamp nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. And he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show his slaves the thing which must soon take place. And behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. But he said to me, do not do that. I am a fellow slave of yours and of the brethren, the prophets, and of those who heed the words of this book. Worship God. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the book of this prophecy, for the time is near. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong, the one who is filthy still be filthy, and let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness, and the one who is holy still keep himself holy. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter by the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices lying. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city which are written in this book. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. We're going to talk about the architecture of heaven, the activities of heaven, and the focus of heaven. We'll see how far we get in this afternoon session. First, the architecture of heaven, or how heaven is laid out. And here we're going to be talking about geography, horticulture, architecture, politics, culture, the layout of heaven. We see the city... In verse 2 of chapter 21, John says, I saw the holy city. Some of you are city people. For some of you, this is comfort. Like Costco is right around the corner. Uh, For those of you who are country folk, uh, there's going to be enough room in the city. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Horses. I heard that. Notice the city, the new Jerusalem, comes down out of heaven from God. So God has 
created at this point a new heavens and new earth. At the end of Revelation 20, heaven and earth disappear, dissolved by fire. They run away from the presence of a holy God in his judgment against evildoers. And then there's a new heavens and a new earth. We don't get the impression that this takes six days or six trillion years. It's just there's a new heavens and a new earth. It's in place. And this new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven from God made ready like a bride adored for her husband. So a bride on her wedding day, totally decked out, coming down the aisle. That is the scene of this great and massive city coming down onto the new earth. Notice this bride is described in verse 9. Uh, the angel says to John, Come here, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Uh, these are the people of God purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ, redeemed for him, gathered together in a community, a city, a population of worshipers, a people for his own possession. Notice in verse 10, again, this city, the holy city, Jerusalem, comes down out of heaven from God, verse 11, having the glory of God. It is a brilliant city, like a jewel, brilliance like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper. Now, this city is radiating the glory, the beauty of God. By the way, glory, when you see that in your Bible, in your Old Testament, the word for glory is the word for heaviness or weightiness. And the word for glory in your New Testament is refulgent light, brilliance emanating out from God. If we combine these two realities, we're talking about the significant brilliance of the combined attributes of God shining out in unapproachable light. That's the glory of God. And the city is filled with it, filled with him and his brilliance and his glory. Notice the city has walls. Verse 12, there's a great and high wall with 12 gates. At the gates, 12 angels. Names written on those gates. The names of the gates are the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. Um, by the way, it's not clear which tribes those are. Uh, I did a survey of all the tribes of Israel about seven years ago, and every single list of the 12 tribes in biblical history is different. <laughs> and, and there's a tremendous theology in the way the tribes are listed. Don't just... Uh, zoom over those names. There's something going on in the plan of God in the way the tribes are listed. You know, you have 12 sons um, of Jacob, who is Israel, um, but then one of those sons has two sons that take on tribe names. One tribe name gets set aside because of their idolatry and bringing idolatry into the land of Israel, and so they don't get their name in the list anymore. And so there's a whole progression of the way the lists are conveyed. I can't wait to find out which 12 names are on these foundation stones at the gates of the wall. And then verse 13 uh, tells us three on each side, north, south, east, west. Uh, the wall of the city has 12 foundation stones, and on those foundation stones are the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Again, which 12? I assume Judas isn't on there. Is it Matthias? Is it Paul? Is it Barnabas? Um, does somebody get half a stone? I can't wait to find out. Uh, which 12 names are on those foundation stones. And I want you to notice the dimensions here. The dimensions are staggering. The one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its wall. Let's start with the wall in verse 17. The wall is 72 yards. 72 yards. That's three quarters of a football field. That's a big wall, isn't it? No, that's not a big wall. I can walk around a football field, lickety-split. 72 yards thick. That's the thickness of the wall. Um, how do we know that's the thickness of the wall? Well, the, the other dimensions sort of lend a clue here. Verse 16, the city is laid out as a square, and its length is as great as its width. Um, and he measured the city with a rod 1,500 miles. 1,500 miles. So just to give you... Um, sort of a scale of that, Kansas City to San Francisco is almost exactly 1,500 miles. Kansas City to San Francisco. Um, that's the length. Uh, the width would be something like um, Nogales to beyond Vancouver. 
I could only get 1,300 miles between a, a city near the border of Mexico and a, a city in Canada. So it's larger than the Canada and Mexico border. Um, that's a big city. If you've driven one of the great megalopolises of the, the United States, whether it's the Northeastern Corridor, uh, Boston, D.C., New York, and all of that, or just the L.A. Basin, and you've driven from San Diego to Santa Barbara, you know what nonstop city can look like, and that's just a dot on a map. Kansas City to San Francisco, Canada to Mexico, Canada to Mexico, uh, is a massive amount of real estate. Now notice what verse 16 says. Its length and its width, oh, and its height are all equal. That's like kind of an afterthought thrown in there. Have you ever noticed that word height in Revelation 21, 16? The size of the city are equal in length, width, and height. It's a cube. And it goes 1,500 miles up. Now, to, to get some dimensions on that, um, the International Space Station orbits the Earth in space at an average of 240 miles up. International Space Station, you can wave at it sometimes if you see it going by. Um, 240 miles up. This city is 1,500 miles vertically. So on the present Earth, the Earth is about like this. We had some of our engineer types in the trust last year sort of map this out. If the Earth is something like this and the cube sits on top of it like this and the International Space Station is hitting like the 220th floor out of 1,500. It's a staggering piece of architecture. We have no idea how big the new earth is. Uh, we're not given the new earth's proportions. Um, th this city could sit on a vastly bigger new earth um, or the same size, we just don't know. But if you were to imagine that every ceiling, every floor was one mile high, those are vaulted ceilings, right? 5,000 feet, sea level to Denver, you know, five times the height of an air traffic pattern over an airport. Um, if every ceiling was a mile high, then we're talking about 1,500 floors going up each, um, each with a mile up. And the, the square footage uh, would be 1,500 square miles times 1,500 square miles. Um, if you did 1,000 foot ceilings, which is the height of the Eiffel Tower, then you would have 7,920 floors or 11,880,000 square miles of real estate in the city. It's a massive city. I just wanted us to not feel claustrophobic. You mean I'm going to live in a box? Um, th this is more than the surface area of the, of the land area of the earth um, that, that is contained in this place that God has designed. We can understand a little bit what Jesus meant in John 14, 1 to 3, when he said, in my Father's house are many mansions. I go there to prepare a place for you. Uh, personal preparation by the Lord for his people of a home, a belonging, a place with him, a place that radiates out his glorious beauty uh, prepared for the enjoyment of his people. Some of you are city people, some of you are outdoorsy people. Um, I, I don't think there's going to be problems uh, finding the kinds of things that um, demonstrate God's kindness to us in the provision of enjoyments. Notice the wall material in verses 18 to 20. The material of the wall was jasper. All of these things that, that we're looking at, by the way, are, are um, ways of describing the precious nature of the materials used. All of these stones described here are rare minerals for us, the kinds of things we make teeny tiny little pieces of jewelry out of. <laughs> and what God has done with these precious elements is construct massive architecture. All of this um, precious material. 
He says the material of the wall was jasper. I don't know what the walls are like in your backyard and what they're made out of. Probably not precious stones. The city was pure gold, and John says it's pure gold like clear glass. I can't wait to understand that. Uh, a, a kind of gold that is so pure that it can be seen through, uh, just beautiful. He talks about the foundation stones of the city wall. You know, we, what, we pour concrete slabs. Uh, what does God do? Uh, every kind of precious stone. And, and he lists all of those stones there. By the way, it's no mistake that when you're reading your Old Testament and you see these lists of precious stones in your Old Testament and, and they're on some of the priestly garb, that priestly garb, it's, it's not like heaven is imitating the breastplate or the ephod, right? Those things were patterned after something that is eternal and real and forever. All of those things were an attempt to bring a, what we're going to call a preminder of what is to come to the earth for God's people. Verse 21 describes the gates. You know, this is just kind of common phraseology uh, for us, the pearly gates. This is where this comes from. The 12 gates were 12 pearls. Uh, each one of the gates was a single pearl. Uh, I, I don't know how big these pearls are, but if they're in proportion to a 72-yard thick wall, uh, if they're in proportion to just the staggering dimensions of the rest of the city, and there's only three gates on each side of a 1,500-mile wall, then they're probably big pearls. I want to see the oyster. <laughs> the streets, verse 21, pure gold, like transparent glass. Streets in the first century were not made of pure gold. I don't know if you know that. Um, they were made of compacted trash. Um, I don't know if you've ever thrown a banana peel out the window and then stepped on it, not slipping, but stepped on it, and then wait a week, step on it some more, throw out some paper garbage, um, your watermelon rind, and then some old meat byproducts, and then just all the waste material that comes out of your house and just put it there in the street and continue to step on it. Eventually, it makes a really nice pavement. That, that's what streets were made of in cities in the ancient world. What are the streets made of in heaven? This, this stuff you throw away, <laughs> pure gold. In, in other words, every element of this city has been designed to reflect the purity and beauty of God who is there. It's such that God's character diffuses out through the materials that are used for the construction of the city. And every piece of the city is a reminder of this reality. You know, today we don't make streets out of trash, thankfully. But did you know that to construct a new two-lane undivided road is two to three million dollars per mile. Um, that's in a rural area. Three to five million dollars in urban areas. A four-lane highway, four to six million dollars per mile. Um, eight to ten million dollars per mile for a freeway in an urban area. To construct a new six-lane interstate highway, seven million dollars a mile in a rural area, 11 million or more per mile in a city. So we understand dropping money on streets. Um, but we don't use gold. Notice the temple in verse 22. Mm, there is no temple. Uh, we're going to come back to this theme, but to trace the question in your Bible as you read left to right, as you read uh, McShane Murray, M Murray McShane plan, uh, or you read a chronological plan, uh, Genesis to Revelation, if you ask the question, where does God dwell? You get to find a really fascinating progression. This is the end. This is the end. Um, there are tents, tabernacles, temples, people who are called temples, but, but now this. There's no temple, verse 21. Everything we've gotten used to 
or verse 22. Everything we've gotten used to in biblical history up to this point, all the first things, the old things that have passed away, that's done. Something brand new is in place. No temple in the city. Why? Because the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. The Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. Um, no more walls, no more barriers, no more priesthood, no more access to God through things or through people, but direct access and fellowship with the Lord, that is the master of everything, God, the, the one uncreated being in all the universe, the Lord God, the Almighty, the Pantocrator, the, the, one, the one whom all creatures fear, and yet what has he done? He has made himself our home. Interesting Trinitarian verse here as well because um, the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb, two persons are its singular what? Temple. That's interesting. Verse 23, notice the lighting. The city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. By the way, um, a lot of people have a problem with the opening pages of their Bibles they can't figure out how there was light when the sun wasn't created. Um, no problem here. Sun's not needed. God is the light. Jesus is the lamp. The answer was always Jesus. Right? Um, God is the source of the light of the sun anyway. But here, this light in this city is all him. And the nations will walk by its light, verse 24. Notice that there is travel, commerce, relationships in verses 24 to 27. John writes, The nations will walk by the light. The kings of the earth will bring their glory into the city. Um, that is, uh, kings on the new earth um, bringing their glory into the city um, as tribute and as worship to God. And in the ancient Near East, when you had kings who were subjugated by another king, those kings would bring tribute, regular tribute to the king who was over them. Um, here, the, the best of the best of redeemed humanity um, are seen as those subject to the king of kings, bringing everything they have as worship to him into the city. Um, this gives us a little bit of a clue as well that all of our activities are not going to be in the cube, that there is a going out and a coming in. There is a, a bringing in of industry uh, into the city as worship to Jesus Christ. Uh, verse 25, in the daytime, <laughs> for there will never be night there. We're just so used to categories of, well, there's day and there's night. Well, there's day, yeah, there, parenthesis, there's not going to be any night. <laughs> and so during the daytime, which is all the time, its gates will never be closed. Uh, this is just a picture of absolute safety you, you, you close the, the gates at a wall of a fortified city because there were enemies. And this is just safe. And they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. And notice what does not come in. Nothing unclean. No one practicing abomination and lying shall ever come into it but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And if you're thinking, wait a second, I, I'm unclean. I've lied. You know, we, we read earlier some of the other um, things that are excluded. <laughs> None of us naturally belong in this city. Right? We, we read these exclusions in 21 and then later on in chapter 22, and we think, oh, the dogs, the immoral, the, 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 those who practice witchcraft and lying, that, that's me. But this phrase, those in are those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And, and those aren't the people who have never lied, never sinned, never practiced witchcraft, never been abominable but the ones who have been forgiven, who have been purchased by the blood of the Lamb and redeemed and declared righteous, qualified to come in 
to the city. The unclean in this verse, the one practicing abomination and lying, are those whose sins have never been covered, whose sins have never been removed as far as the east is from the west, who still stand before their maker with all of their deeds in their hands. And so the culture of this place is fundamentally different than what we've experienced. Notice the river in chapter 22, verse 1. He showed me the river of the water of life. It comes out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, and it's clear as crystal, flowing down the middle of the street. We had 100-year rains a couple years ago, and water flowed down the middle of the street. You know, I I don't know if I have a category for thinking of of a street with a great big river flowing down the middle of it. These must be big streets. An amazing picture. Notice the tree in verse 22, or chapter 22, verse 2. On either side of the river was the tree of life. Okay, so here's this river of life flowing out of the throne, and on either side of the river is a singular tree. Is it like General Sherman? You know, that giant redwood with the hole cut in it for cars to pass through? Anybody seen General Sherman? Is it still, is it still, did it die? It fell? I think General Sherman fell. See, the tree of life in heaven will never fall. It just keeps standing. But it, 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 it seems like there's this arch in the tree under which the, the river of life flows, and this tree bears 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. Um, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. You think, I like the idea of eating fruit, 12 different kinds of fruit from one tree. That's going to be exciting. wonder what that tastes like. Um. But healing of the nations, does, does that mean if I skin my knee, I go get a leaf off the tree and it, it heals it? Um, you know, are, are there going to be injuries in the eternal state and, and do I need healing? Is there going to be, well, no, we've already seen there's no more sickness, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. The old things have gone. Um, so so why, why a tree with healing leaves? Um, we talked about the tree of life earlier as being a tangible evidence of God's sustaining of eternal life. And you need to understand something about creaturely existence. We will always be dependent. Even in the eternal state, when you possess eternal life, you will never possess it intrinsically. You'll never possess it independently. You will always be dependent on the creator to give and to give and to give life. I think the tree of life and the, the, the healing leaves for the nations um, it is for the physical, tangible reminder that God is the one giving this life. Now, we won't be able to sin. I don't think we'll be able to forget. I think forgetting that would be a sin. I don't think we'll be able to forget. But just this perpetual physical, visible reminder that God is the giver of eternal life. And here's more of the culture, verses 3 to 5. There will no longer be any curse. No more curse. So we're talking here about a, uh, a culture of communication, culture of life, a culture of work. We'll talk about the activities of heaven in just a moment, but the curse is gone. The curse that came as a result of man's sin and the fall. The curse that springs up weeds in the garden. The curse that produced things like mayonnaise and... I'm just kidding. (laughs) Mosquitoes. How's that one? Um, the, The curse of frustration on every endeavor under the sun. Like the refrain from Ecclesiastes. Everything's frustrated because God has bent the created order through the curse so that you cannot get satisfaction, joy, life, or ultimate things out of the stuff under the sun. And, and, and the curse on mankind and the curse on creation, rust, uh, the second law of thermodynamics, things fall apart. All of these things are undone such that God's design for creator, 
creature and creation to have the perfect trifecta of relationship that man was designed for. God as king of all kings, man, God's image bearer, as his sub-regent over the created order, ruling and governing and filling the created order with the glory of God through image bearing. This is what Adam and Eve were commanded to do in the Garden of Eden, and they failed. And this is what all of redeemed humanity will do for all of eternity. And the curse on all of it is gone. Uh, the, the giraffes, uh, the broccoli, the dolphins, uh, they will be very glad for this. Uh, Romans 8 tells us that even the created order cranes its neck looking around the corner, eagerly waiting for the glory of the children of God. Uh, in other words, the duck-billed platypus can't wait until you look like Jesus. <laughs> because it will be set free from its bondage to decay. Uh, all, of, all of God's created order is heading this direction. Uh, notice again in verse 3, no curse. And the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. Um, just consider that. God's throne, uh, the emblem of his sovereign majesty and his rulership, his godness, right there. And nothing wrong, nothing subversive, nothing treasonous or treacherous will be there. Not the vestiges of treason in my own rebellious heart, and not all Satan and all of his hordes, and not all of a rebellious humanity with their fist in God's face, none of that will be there, but the throne of God in the midst of his people. And of course, this is the throne of God the Father and of the Lamb. Why is the second person of the Trinity called a Lamb? Because he was the Isaiah 53 Lamb. He was the Passover Lamb. He was the Levitical sacrificial system Lamb who like a sheep before his shears, like a lamb before the slaughter, went to the cross, mocked by men, crushed by his Father, in order to bring us to him. And he will forever be known as the Lamb. Revelation 5 shows us those concentric circles of worship around Jesus, and he is called the Lion of the tribe of Judah and the Lamb slain. And we'll never get past the reality of what Jesus did for us on the cross. And finally, verse 3, his slaves will serve him. His slaves will serve him. Slavery is a bad word. Not when you're a slave of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Not when your master truly has your best interest in mind, at heart, and in his power. And when he executes perfectly his plan and provision and promise for you. It just will never be bad. In fact, it will be better than you running your own life when we are completely subject to our king and we only ever do his will. Can you imagine one single conversation between two human beings without sin? Just one. With, with no wondering in my mind, oh, what are they thinking? What do they mean by that? What were their intentions? What, what is the motivation behind that? No second guessing. No misunderstandings. Clarity of expression and clarity of reception. Integrity of expression and integrity of reception. Love all the time. If, if we just take one aspect of our lives like talking, and think about what it means for the, the throne to be in our midst and the slaves of God to serve him in everything that they do. This is going to be glorious. What a liberation. Verse 4. They will see his face. His name will be on their foreheads. No longer any night. No need, no need of light of lamp or the light of the sun because the Lord God will illumine them and they will, they will reign forever, forever and, ever. and ever. So how do so we organize, organize everything, 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 everything and whatever, whatever level, level you're at, you're at whatever you have, you have, whatever, whatever organizational, organizational things, things God provides?
God's lives you. Um, um, think about when the, about when the cabinet, cabinet door, door is shut. Is it dark is in it there? there? You get the impression that throughout the city, which has walls, which has rooms, that the light of God, the, the brilliance of His glory is just diffusing through everything. No shadows. But that light just permeates every nook and cranny and every corner and every deep, dark recesses. You wouldn't want light to shine in your cabinets now, but you will then. Just glorious. And notice the last phrase of verse 5. And they, that is the slaves of God, will reign forever and ever. You will reign forever and ever. Your role as one created by God to represent Him in the created order and redeemed by Jesus Christ to actually live up to your fundamental created purpose is to reign. That's a king word. Uh, C.S. Lewis got it right in the kings and queens and the, all that stuff. Um, every believer in Jesus Christ is designed to reign on the new earth. Wait, how does a slave reign? We get to be slaves and we get to be kings and we get to be queens. The, the, the culture of heaven, the architecture of heaven, all are in keeping with the greatness and glory of the one who is at the very center of it. All right, turn the page. Next session. Let's talk about some of the activities of heaven. The activities of heaven. Things to look forward to in heaven. Uh, these aren't in any particular order, although we're saving the best for last. Eating. You thought eating was saving the best for last. It's not. It's important. It's good. All right. Genesis 2, 16 and 17. So much of what shows up in the first two chapters of your Bible shows up in the last two chapters of your Bible. Um, if you want to skip everything in between and look at what Adam and Eve didn't have in perfection but had temporarily, leave out everything in the middle and skip to the new heavens and new earth, you see the recovery of what was lost, but way better. But there are echoes uh, of Genesis 1 and 2 in Revelation 21 and 22. One of those is eating. Genesis 2, 16 and 17, Yahweh God commanded the man saying, from any tree of the garden, you may eat freely. Now just stop right there. Um, Adam was immortal at this point. What was he eating for? Hey, God did not say, now listen Adam, you've got this garden here, you've got to cultivate it and tend it, and um, you need fuel. So, you know, about every three hours, about every six hours, however you want to sort of regulate this, make sure you get some calories. He didn't say that. It was just an invitation to this smorgasbord of unbelievable provision of God that, that, that didn't take the effort that agriculture takes today under the curse. It was just there. I mean, it literally grew on trees. And it was just, have at it, Adam. Eat freely. You may eat freely. Um, Revelation 22, 2 tells us that this uh, tree of life in the middle of the city on either side of the river has fruit. Fruit. Different kinds of fruit. Um, yielding its fruit every month. So we have food in the garden. We've got food in the eternal state. Um, Revelation 22, or uh, Luke 22, 29 and 30, Jesus talks about feasting with his disciples. Feasting with his disciples. Um, you'll remember that in Jesus' resurrection body, he ate fish. Remember that on the beach? There will be eating in heaven. And, and eating without consequence, by the way. Just eating for the sheer delight of it. Have you ever considered why taste buds? Oh, taste buds are an evolutionary feature that keeps us from eating things that will kill us. Um, there's a whole palette 
of discernible, different flavors available in what we consume and the foods that are available for us to have fuel for. Could you imagine if eating was just like filling up the tank in your car? Um, man, I have to eat again. Go plug it in, get this over with, move on with life. No, we, we sit down and we enjoy a meal. And, and it's just exquisite. Um, turn to Isaiah 25. Isaiah 25 gives us a picture of the eternal state. I didn't have anywhere in our outline to put this, and it's one of my favorite passages, so we stuck it under eating. <laughs> Verse 6, Yahweh of hosts will prepare a lavish banquet for all peoples on this mountain. By the way, um, Isaiah was a prophet of Israel speaking to Jews, and here he's giving them this promise that God's preparing a lavish banquet for all peoples. That's an interesting Old Testament perspective. A banquet of aged wine, choice pieces with marrow, and refined aged wine. Now, um, choice pieces with marrow um, means that vegetarians aren't going to be happy in heaven. <laughs> but think about this. There's no death. Where do you get a ribeye? It must be one of the trees. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think we'll be killing cows, but there will be steak. Frozen. <laughs> On this mountain, verse 7, he will swallow up the covering which is over all peoples. What is this covering? He explains it. Even the veil which is stretched over all nations, um, that, is the, that is the curse. That is a, the, the dark, bleak covering that affects every human being in all of human history. Verse 8, God will swallow up death for all time. This is how we know this is an eternal state passage. And the Lord Yahweh will wipe tears from all faces. He will remove the reproach of his people from all the earth, for Yahweh has spoken. And it will be said in that day, behold, and, and here we go, right to the focus of heaven. This is our God for whom we have waited, that he might save us. This is Yahweh for whom we have waited. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. People from every tongue, tribe, nation, people gathered around God and feasting eating for the sheer enjoyment for the sheer fellowship for the sheer taste buds and the flavor of it something else to look forward to uh, turn to John 20 24 to 26 And, and what I have listed here in my notes is walking through walls. Um, but probably the best way to think about what we're going to describe is um, something different about the physicality of a resurrection body. Okay, look at John 20, 24. Thomas, one of the 12, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and I put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. After eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut and stood in their midst and said, peace be with you. Um, the, the, the grammar here is pretty clear. The doors had been shut and were still shut when Jesus entered the room. The, the doors having been shut, oh, and then Jesus opened the room. No, the, the doors having been shut, 
Jesus came into the room. And then what does he do but tell Thomas, I'm not a ghost, put your hands right here. Real physicality, a real human body, a real post-resurrection glorified body in which Jesus proceeds to eat, be touched, and he just walked through the wall or the closed doors. Now, um, theoretical physicists would tell us that it is actually possible to do that. I mean, most of what you are is made up of empty space, electrons circulating orbits uh, around nucleuses. And, and if somehow you could line up all those uh, or electrons, orbits, and the, the atomic particles uh, just right, and if you could just get space to interact with space, you could walk through each other. You could walk through the wall, but try it. There, there's something really unique about what Jesus is doing here and, and demonstrating uh, what's happening with his very real physical body. Um, we'll come back to our physical bodies in a few moments. Uh, something else to look forward to in heaven. Um, I think, I think, and that, that's as far as I'm willing to go with this one, is flying. Um, some of you don't like the idea of flying. Some of you dream about flying. Um, I would be on that side of things. I dream about flying. Um, listen to uh, Isaiah 40, 31a. Those who wait on the Lord, um, God will mount them up with wings as eagles. Um, now, does that mean that we get wings? I don't know. I, I think that's a metaphor in Isaiah 40, 31, describing endurance. Um, eagles in the ancient Near East or condors or vultures, any of these large winged birds were seen to just ride the thermals and coast effortlessly. Um, we'll come back to Isaiah 40 and, and talk about um, the nature of that metaphor in just a minute. But if we think back to Revelation 21, 16, remember the dimensions of the New Jerusalem? Um, I don't know if you call it flying or falling, but I did some calculations, and if you jumped off the top, in, in, in current sea level atmospheric conditions, well, let's just assume that all the way up so we don't have to get too technical here, um, nine and a half hour free fall. If you're, you know, yeah. Now, some people might just say, well, you're just falling with style. But um, if, if we're not able to fly in heaven, that's a long walk back up. <laughs> but we've got forever, right? And that leads us to the next one. Turn to Isaiah 40. Turn to Isaiah 40. And we'll start in verse 28. And Isaiah is saying these things uh, to the people of Israel as if they should have already known them. Do you not know, Isaiah 40, 28, have you not heard the everlasting God, Yahweh, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired? His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly. Think about that. <clears throat> um, I am now older than every NFL quarterback. They still seem like grown men. Like, oh man, those guys are, they're all younger than me. It's kind of a weird phase in life. Um, <laughs> but I feel old. I feel old. And, and notice what Isaiah says. Youths, the 20-year-old the in his prime, what, what happens to the youth? grows weary and tired. And vigorous young men, the, 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 the Navy SEALs, the best of the best elite soldiers of Israel, the vigorous young men stumble badly. Yet, those who wait for Yahweh will gain new strength, mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. What is God promising for his people that wait on him? And all of us are on the decline physically. Um, you know this. <laughs> Some of you are denying it. But we're on the decline physically. <laughs> and yet Yahweh promises there will be new strength so as to run and not get tired. 
what will that be like? For me, that's like 10 yards. <laughs> for my wife, that's like a half marathon. For Christina, that's what a, what's, the, what's the longest, farthest you run? Mm -hmm. do, do you stop at 26.20 and that's it? Is it just over? Okay. All right. Okay. Anybody ever run longer than 26.2? All right, you win. <laughs> Anybody else run marathons? You're alone. Okay, you're crazy. We all knew it. <laughs> I ran a 5K with Janet, and I perished. <laughs> the thought of running, I, lo I love the idea of running. I mean, like, one foot in front of the other, as hard as you can, in a long stride, and the wind blowing through what used to be hair. <laughs> that, oh, man, it would be so fun. But then I get tired, and I'm like, no, it's not fun. <laughs> to run and not get weary. The, listen, the thought of uh, rolling hills and green grass in a new earth and just say, I see those mountain cap snow-capped mountains way off in the distance after about 18 undulating green mountains. I think I'd just sort of run over there. How great is that going to be? And 1,500 miles of stairs to jump off the top one more time. <laughs> it's okay. Something else to look forward to in heaven. Working. 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 Um, we read it in Revelation 22, 3. Um, the Lord's slaves will serve him. We'll be working. We will be working. Um, 1 Corinthians 3 uh, tells us that we will um, administrate angels. Um, Jesus makes other promises. Um, Luke 19, uh, we won't turn there, but Luke 19, Jesus promises his disciples who are faithful. Um, you've been faithful with these little things. I'll give you five cities to govern. I'll give you ten cities to govern. Uh, that's another indication that outside the cube there's other places. And, and there's administrating these things. And we think of government and we go, oh, oh. Um, here in heaven, only good. Administrating, ruling, governing. Um, judging angels doesn't mean angels sinned and you gotta go give them a spanking or something, right? Judging angels... Um, means um, discerning what the best next thing to do um, in whatever sphere we're working. I can't wait to see what enterprise looks like, industry looks like, um, unmarred by sin. When man does, in the created order, what man was always designed to do. I mean, you think about the emergence of just railways in, in, in the 19th century that, that went from coast to coast where I've never dug up iron ore and refined it into steel and turned it into a locomotive that could carry cargo from one end of the country to the other. But somebody did. <laughs> a bunch of somebody's working together did. Um, what's it going to look like when there is industry and creativity and work without sin? <laughs> it's going to be staggering. Um, by the way, um, work was not the curse Turn to Genesis 2.15. Work is not a fruit of the fall. Work predates the fall. Genesis 2.15, Yahweh God took the man, Adam, put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. He was a gardener. He worked. He labored. But it wasn't laborious. Right? What is the curse? Uh, look at Genesis 3, verse 17. To Adam he said, Because you've listened to the voice of your wife, you've eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat. There's the difference. Cultivate it and keep it. And Adam, guess what? It's going to be fun all the time. Now, toilsome. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life thorns and thistles it will grow for you and you'll eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face you will eat bread out the ground <laughs> that's Hebrew now there's a promise to Adam in that you're not going to starve you will get to eat it's a kindness from the Lord 
but everything's different. Now, work stinks. I, I, don't know, I don't know if you've ever tried to help people think about their next job when they're discontent with their current job. Have you ever tried to help somebody think through that? Um, oh, my next job's gonna be better. Well, what's wrong with your current job? Oh, uh, it's just, it stinks. Well, they all stink. Have you read Genesis 3? <laughs> they do. And, and, and your next one stinks too, and the next one after that, and the next one after that. And, and listen, I have the best job on the planet. I do. And, and it falls under Genesis 3. There are frustrations under the curse of God. It's designed by him to do that so that I don't worship and serve the created thing rather than the creator who's forever praised. So that I don't find my satisfaction under the sun when under the sun is cursed and sinned, uh, uh, full of sin and is fallen. Um, God is taking us to another version of work. By the way, um, for the believer, uh, for the unbeliever, all work is under the curse. For the believer, though every job you'll ever have is under the curse of God, it is also redeemable and can be under the blessing of God so that you can actually worship him as you build widgets. And your employer may have no idea that you're secretly worshiping God while you're building widgets. All he wants is 10 widgets. And you're over there having a great time because God is redeeming this work. I can do it for him and it matters for eternity. And even the way you build widgets purchases for you unrustable, unstealable, unmoth-eatable things in the eternal state. So work in the garden, great all the time. By the way, um, my son Emmett and I can both, with shovel in hand, dig a hole in the ground in the backyard. For him, it's play. For me, it's work. What's the difference? <laughs> you see, it's not the task itself. And, and there's a whole set of tasks coming for us in the eternal state that will only be fun all the time. All right, 1 Corinthians 15, something else to look forward to in heaven is new bodies. Amen and amen, I hear it. Um, many of us feel the progressive demise that comes with just the natural order of things in a fallen world. Um, some of us start out um, under excruciating physical malady and never get relief. I'm not, I'm not talking about myself, but I mean, you know the David Bowers um, and others who um, never seem to have just the freedom of feeling a day, oh, I, I don't notice anything physically. I'm just walking through life. The rest of us sort of come to these things bit by bit, and, and there's a, a downhill slide we're all trying to run away from and, and correct. But something is coming. 1 Corinthians 15, we'll start in verse 42. The whole chapter is worth reading. I'll just point out a couple of the contrasts between your present body and your future body. Paul says, so is the resurrection of the dead. Uh, just as there's different glories of stars, there are different glories in bodies. But the body is sown perishable, and it is raised imperishable. That's an amazing statement. Your body right now is perishable. There, there's an expiration date. Um, it's falling apart. You can't stop it. And you're going to get a new body that it is impossible to perish, impossible to fall apart, impossible to be injured, impossible to break. Verse 43, sown in dishonor, raised in glory. Um, the human body on earth goes through various phases of its own glory. Um, there are uh, times when you feel great and, and you're in your physical prime and and things are going well, but everybody at the end of life faces an ignominious physicality where things have broken down and things don't work, um, whether it's the, 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 the last day of a prolonged illness or, or whether it's some catastrophic injury, the human body ends in weakness. 
It ends dishonorably. It, it, it ends in, 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 a, in a state that I don't want anybody to see me like this. And it's raised, and here's this word, in glory. Glory. Um, glory here is not a place. It's a condition. The, the body is raised to a glorious condition. Sown in weakness, raised in power. You're at your weakest moment physically when you breathe your last. And then at the resurrection, power. It is sown natural and it is raised spiritual. And, and, and Paul here in verse 44 does not mean uh, sort of a mystical, wispy, uh, non-corporeal body of some sort. Uh, by spiritual body, it, it's really something like supernatural body. Um, the, the kind of body that Jesus possessed after his own resurrection. He was the first fruits of the kind of resurrection that's being talked about here. Real physicality, touchable, eating food, and yet walking through walls and then zipping up to the right hand of the Father. Different. Verse 50. I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will all be changed. For the perishable must put on the imperishable, the mortal must put on immortality. Uh, that, that's a new body we have to look forward to immortal, imperishable physicality. No sickness, Revelation 22, 2. No pain, Revelation 21, 4. No sorrow, 21, 4. Um, no diminishing returns. Economists and drug users know what that is. You, you need more of the something to get the same level of satisfaction. Um, no more of that. Um, the, the, the law of thermodynamics, second law of thermodynamics is done. The curse, the, the frustration of the created environment, Romans 8, 19 to 23 is done. And Revelation 22, 3, no more curse. All of that trying to grasp after one more thing that's going to get what I think I need, done. All of that's done. Um, there will be no more of the bluesy blahs. You know, the, 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 the I almost said melancholy the melancholy of wistfulness that ah, I just don't feel right. I just don't feel good. Is it that I don't belong here? Um, what, what is that? And, and Psalm 8411 tells us that our God is a sun and shield and, and he only has good things for us. And then no more sin. You can write down Romans 8, 28 to 30. Um, you can write down 2 Peter 3.13. Um, lots of verses on this. Uh, Romans 8.28 says, We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him, called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also what? Predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. You will be perfectly and completely brought into conformity with the Lord Jesus Christ. Sinless. Sinless. Unable to sin. Right? Adam and Eve in the garden, able to sin. <clears throat> Humanity outside of Christ, unable not to sin. You in Christ, able not to sin. And then you in eternity, unable to sin. You just will not have the capacity for it whatsoever. I, I don't know about you, I've, I've woken up at times going, oh, did I sin my way out of heaven? <laughs> You know, is it going to be possible to, to forsake the Lord? I mean, Satan was in heaven, and then he got, uh, you know, booted out. He, he sinned. Is it possible for perfected beings to, to negate all of this? No. No, God permanently perfects believers. You will never be able to sin again. You will never be able to have a cross thought a wrong word, a misplaced affection, an inordinate desire. You will never again be able to offend anyone or be offended by anyone. 
and you will never again hold dear things that crucified your Savior. You will never again be entertained by things that people will spend eternity in hell suffering for. You will be unable to sin. And there's one more thing to look forward to in heaven, without which heaven would not be heaven at all. If you could eat without consequence, walk through walls, work while having fun all the time, fly, run without getting tired, have a new body, no sickness, no pain, no sorrow, no diminishing returns, no blahs, and no sin. But you didn't have this last thing, heaven would not be heaven. And it's where we're going in our session this evening. <laughs> Let's sing a little bit. Thank you.